So my name is Steve Niemela. I'm going to be talking to you again tonight about Pacific Fisher. This is uh, the majority of my talk will be about a, a project that we've done for the last three years with funding from Oregon Wildlife through a small grant of theirs. Um, and so most of the talk will be about that, but I will talk about the Fisher more broadly, kind of how it's doing uh, nationwide and in Oregon, talk to you about some of the um, the things that are underway legally with the animal right now, and uh, get into some of the biology. And although the talk is mostly centered on Fisher, we put out a lot of game cameras, so I'll have some really good, and I think some pretty entertaining uh, pictures and some video for you to enjoy later too. So just to start off, the Pacific Fisher is a member of the weasel family in the Mustelidae. Uh, it is a a pretty interesting animal in that it has a very diverse uh, diet and if there's any one sort of fact that's out there about the fisher in popular culture it's that they eat porcupines. So that ha uh, is a pretty interesting trick to be able to do uh, but porcupines are not actually necessarily their main source of food but it is one of the prey items that they eat. Um, they're solitary animals, they're relatively, uh, they're not uh, very social, they live most of the year by themselves, or if you're a female with some young. In the, in the fall, or I'm sorry, in the winter, in early spring though, the males go on these large, long walkabouts looking for females. So during that time of year, they can act, you know, they're going to interact socially for reproduction. The males tend to be uh, quite a bit bigger than the females, uh, which is typical of a lot of mammals. But that fact that the males go um, on these large, um, journeys to try and find a female is going to be important later when I start talking about why we chose the survey methodology and the time frame that we did. So uh, nationwide, fishers have been extirpated, removed from a lot of their native range. So in this map here, the dark gray represents where fishers once existed and the light gray interior of the dark gray is where they exist currently. So um, on the Pacific Coast, what we're going to be discussing tonight is what's referred to as the Pacific Fisher. So that's the animal in California, Washington, and Oregon. Um, the Fisher here in Oregon only exists here in uh, Southern Oregon. So, and, and I'll repeat this a bunch of times, but we have a native population of Fisher that were never extirpated in the Applegate, in the Klamath and Siskiyou Mountains. And we have a reintroduced population of Fisher in the Cascade Mountain range. Um, but throughout uh, the rest of their range, there are places where they've been uh, removed from, the, most of the Midwest and the East. However, they still have very good populations of, of fisher in the um, Northeast and in the upper Midwest. So where I grew up was in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And that's a picture of my dad, and that's one of the, and my dad's a fur trapper, and that's, a, that's actually a Pacific fisher that he caught in Michigan. So in Michigan and parts of the Northeast, the, this animal has a robust enough population that they can actually uh, sustain harvest on them. So not so here in Oregon. In Oregon, uh, fisher trapping was stopped in 1937. These animals, and here, here's an example, you're, I can pass it around or you can, you're welcome to come up, but this is an example of the Pacific fisher's pelt. It is a very um, it's a very nice fur. It was highly desired. And so the animal faced a lot of pressure from trapping. Now here in Oregon, uh, it wasn't just trapping pressure, um, which uh, trapping alone was uh, the result of the turn of the century and a lot of reduced wildlife populations. But this particular animal um, also requires cavities. So it needs mature forest. The, the females have to have dens that they can go into of a certain size to be able to raise their young. So this animal was vulnerable not only to trapping but also to deforestation and uh, having a process where we're getting rid of a lot of mature forests. So there was kind of a double threat. Um, I can pass this around. Um, so, uh, but in Oregon we stopped fisher trapping in 1937 they were never completely extirpated from the state, although they were ex extirpated from the majority of the state. The place where we have remnant native fisher is in the Applegate. So Mount Ashland, Klamath, Siskiyou, 
that country is where that was the last stronghold for the Fisher regionally. But in 1961, we introduced, uh, we being the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, reintroduced Fisher from British Columbia into Klamath County and Wallowa County. And uh, some of that uh, desire to reintroduce Fisher goes back to what I mentioned previously of that, this uh, fact that they can eat porcupines and perhaps a perception that they can be more of a control on porcupines. And uh, so some uh, interest from timber companies in reintroducing the species. In 1981, there were more introductions into Jackson County this time, and that stock came from Minnesota. So in the Cascade Mountains, we have this mixed stock of fisher that come from British Columbia and Minnesota. So those of you that perhaps hunt uh, and are familiar with our hunting regulations, this is what are called our wildlife management units. So the, what we call the Applegate Wildlife Management Unit, here's Ashland, Medford, Grants Pass. So I-5 and 199 uh, circumnavigate the Applegate unit. This is the area where we have primarily that native fisher population. And then uh, to the east, in our Rogue unit, in our Dixon unit, the northern end of the Rogue uh, Siskiyou National Forest in the uh, Umpqua National Forest, that's where we have that reintroduced Cascade population. Animals from British Columbia and Minnesota. So again, um, we have those three populations. What I just mentioned, our native Oregon one, our reintroduced population, and then there's also a population in the Sierras. Um, and I, I put this map up, which is a portion of the ecoregions of Oregon, uh, to point out that the Klamath Mountains, where we are, this southern Oregon area, is really an important place for conservation for a wide variety of reasons. The fisher is not the only animal that only exists in this area. Um, for example, we have, just driving around here, you'll see very um, robust and healthy stands of Oregon white oak and California black oak. If you look to the north in the Willamette Valley, a lot of those oaks have been removed for agricultural and development. You look south in California, a lot of oaks have been removed. So again, southern Oregon is kind of a stronghold for a habitat type that is threatened in other parts of the west coast. Uh, western pond turtles, we also have fairly robust populations of western pond turtles, which similarly, again, have been really decimated to the north and to the south. Uh, there's a number of species that have reached the northern limit of their range in our area, Brazilian free-tailed bats, ringtails, which you'll see vid video of later on. Those are, are both species that the upper limit of their range occurs in our area. Uh, the Klamath Mountains also is considered one of the top 100 spots on Earth for uh, biodiversity in terms of plant biodiversity. Of, I think, the 4,000 some odd plant species that occur in Oregon, half of them occur in the Klamath Mountains. So I just say that to point out, to put the fissure in a little bit of context, that we have some really important habitat and some really unique opportunities in our area. And it's a, it's a real special valley to live in. But back to the Pacific Fisher. This animal has been considered a candidate species for listing since 2004. That means it's a candidate for listing as threatened and endangered. And actually, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has said that their listing as threatened or endangered is warranted. They should be listed, but it's precluded by other higher priorities. And for 10 years, almost 10 years, the Pacific Fisher stayed in that candidate species, kind of in, in limbo. But eventually, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service were sued by a variety of env environmental groups, um, basically claiming that you can't have an animal continuously in a candidate status. You have to make a decision. So the S Fish and Wildlife Service has entered into what's called the multi-district settlement. And by September of this year, they should produce a rule that will either recommend listing the fisher as threatened or endangered, or recommend withdrawing it from the candidate species list. And then by next September, by 2015, the Secretary of the Interior will have to decide whether to sign off on that recommendation. So basically, by next September, we'll know whether the Pacific Fisher is, in fact, going to be listed as threatened or endangered or removed from the candidate species list. So not only is the species really interesting biologically, and it has 
a really important ecological role to play as a predator on small animals. But it also has this um, very complicated and int interesting legal framework behind it, which is kind of just the context in which we started doing uh, the work that we did. So before we started doing specific surveys ourselves as a district staff, we had a lot of kind of chance encounters with Fisher. Um, this is actually um, a photo that was sent to us by a private individual, a gentleman named Johnny Armstrong, who took this picture out in the Ashland watershed. You'll see he has much better equipment, <laughs> at least in terms of getting these really high quality pictures, because um, that just is a, a beautiful image and it was captured in the wild using technology not dissimilar to what I'm going to talk about later. We also have gotten pictures from um, some mitigation for uh, the canals that are put in above Prospect. There's requirements for it to have wildlife crossings. Um, well, there was a picture taken of a Pacific Fisher crossing using one of those wildlife crossings, so using it as it was designed to be used, which was great. So this guy right here, I should say, this girl right here, um, is a Pacific Fisher uh, just outside of the Ash, or actually in the Ashland watershed, I guess. Uh, the Forest Service has been doing a project for a number of years now where they've been capturing Fisher and putting radio collars on them and monitoring them, in large part to do an evaluation of how a fuels treatment is going to affect the Fisher in the Ashland watershed. Well, they put this collar on this Fisher and it almost immediately she went off the air. They couldn't tell what had happened with her. In the meantime, we every year do uh, what's called a bear baiting project. It's a, a way we uh, monitor bears. And uh, I put some cameras on some of my sites and just coincidentally happened to catch her. And you can see kind of that her collar, her antenna is all mangled up, which is probably one of the reasons they weren't able but they, to find her. But they were very excited to learn that she was still alive and still in the area. And this one here, this is a really interesting, uh, really interesting story. So we were doing a, a deer research project out in Josephine County to uh, analyze how migratory deer use the winter range in, in Josephine County. And so we had all these deer with radio collars on them and occasionally of course these deer would die and then we'd have to go and pick up the radio collar. Well, um, in this particular instance we went out and looked for probably two hours with our radio telemetry equipment and we could not find this collar. Eventually we realized that our telemetry equipment was pointing us up, up a tree and it appeared as if the collar was in the top of a tree. So uh, I climbed the tree, and when I got to the top, I found this big wood rat nest. And sure enough, as soon as I, I got on it, there's a, the collar has a sensor in it, so if it doesn't move for 24 hours, it sends out a different signal. Well, as soon as I stood on top of this wood rat nest, it, it moved the collar and it changed the signal, and so we knew it was in there. So I dug through the wood rat nest and I found our deer collar buried in. Uh, it's fascinating how a small little wood rat could have dragged that deer collar up all the way up this tree. And so I went back down the tree and I got one of our game cramers, climbed back up the tree or the adjacent tree and I put, uh, I put this uh, camera on it and basically left it out there. I then got snowed out so it was stuck out there for three months. But anyway, one day after all those hours of footage, this Pacific Fisher just happened to run across that wood rat nest and we caught it on uh, videotape. So think of this chain of events that had to happen for us to get this video. First of all, we had to catch the deer, then the die, deer had to die in just the right spot. A wood rat had to carry that thing up, bury it in, in the um, wood rat nest, and then I had to put a camera on it, get snowed out so that it would sit out there for three months. So anyway, I just love the serendipity that led to us actually getting this video. Um, so back to uh, the work that the, the Forest Service was doing. They've been gracious enough to let us ride along and volunteer with them uh, during their trapping. So this is, a, this is a Pacific Fisher that they've captured in the Ashland watershed. You can see they're putting a radio collar on it. This particular Fisher is very dapper. It's got an argyle sock for its, uh, for its uh, blindfold. Uh, but when they capture these animals, they, they do a whole range of measurements. They measure the teeth, they measure skull dimensions, they measure length, they measure weight, they measure um, different aspects of the pads on the paw so potentially they could identify it from tracks later. Um, of course record the sex, record whether there's evidence that, uh, the mam that it's been nursing. So a lot of different information can be captured from, from capturing a fisher. 
So that's the animal. Uh, so just to recap a little bit, we have this animal that's been was almost extirpated from the state of Oregon. We have the one native population in the Applegate. We have this reintroduced population by our agency in the Cascades. And we have in the background a potential listing. A uh, federal listing is threatened and endangered for this species. And uh, a lot of the federal agencies, the BLM and the Forest Service, have been doing work with Fisher and other carnivores for quite a few years. So ODFW wanted to basically help out. We wanted to do some some of the work ourselves. And so we applied for a grant with Oregon Wildlife um, wherein they bought us a bunch of uh, game cameras. So uh, the idea behind the study was to survey zones where the introduced and the native populations might overlap but where they had not been previously surveyed. So uh, one thing that's really interesting is this whole project is really a testament to how fast technology has grown because just 15 years ago, this project, you probably couldn't do it, really, or at least not at the, with the scale of money we're talking about. Because what this study relies on is lightweight digital cameras um, that can take, uh, easily take images of wildlife. But also, and you'll see later, we're snaring hair from these animals so that we can, get the, we can send them off to the lab and the, get the genetics tested. So through genetic testing now, just from a hair sample, they can tell you whether that animal came from British Columbia and Minnesota or from our native Oregon population. And, and so far, except for one animal, there hasn't been any evidence of uh, interbreeding between those two populations. They're almost completely isolated. And it wasn't until just recently that one animal was discovered uh, with genetics from both populations. So to do this survey, there's kind of an accepted protocol that I'll get into in a minute by Zelinsky and Kucera. Um, so we're using kind of a standard approach that everyone should be using. This animal, of course, crosses private lands, BLM lands, federal lands, Forest Service. It doesn't care. So by the very nature of that, it has to be a multi-agency approach to try and document where this creature is occurring. So uh, when we first started the project, there was a great website set up that when you do surveys following this protocol, you could go online and let them know what your results are. Unfortunately, um, I think in 2011, they lost funding for that, for that website. So the website was shut down. We were still able to contact the people that previously ran it directly and give them our data. But it's, it's a real shame when there's such a good tool like that set up and it goes away. Um, so again, in the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains, we got our native fisher and then our introduced fisher. Never the twain shall meet, we thought at the time. There had been no evidence of uh, these animals interbreeding. So what we wanted to do was target our efforts in areas where we thought there might be crossover. Uh, the Forest Service and BLM had been doing a bunch of research down in this area. Um, the Forest Service has a bunch of fisher collared in the Ashland watershed. And they've actually seen fisher come close to I-5 and then kind of turn around. So it's possible that I-5 is a, a pretty good barrier when it comes to animals like small predators. Uh, but anyway, we wanted to put some cameras in the Birdsey and Savage Creek area and then in the Evans Creek area. Because if you look on it at a topographic scale, this whole area is kind of one big ridge line descending down from the Umpqua National Forest where we know there are fisher and then kind of coming northward from the Klamath where again we know there are the native fisher. So we wanted to sample in areas where people hadn't previously sampled, but we thought we might catch an animal that had potentially genetic markers from both populations. So that protocol, the, the Zelinsky and Kucera protocol, it's, it's really a, a, a great idea. It's based on uh, something that every map has on it already, which is the, the standard land survey method with the township range section um, system. So each section is a square mile. So in their sampling protocol, you put four of those sections together and that makes one sampling unit. And then in any one sampling unit, you put two cameras at least a mile apart and you leave it out 28 days. And if you remember how I said earlier, the males are very mobile during the winter. You conduct the surveys during the winter because if the animal's more mobile, that increases your odds of detecting one. So you want to survey 
when your uh, detection rate is the highest. And there's another reason to do it during the winter, which I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a little while. So we tried a, different, a few different things at first. Here's a, a different camera design that we put up. We initially were hanging up sort of blocks of meat and uh, trying to get the scent out. It didn't seem to work very well, and it was a lot of extra effort and material to take. Um, again, here's just a, another example of the collar. Here is one of our boxes, and I've, I've got a, a different version of it here. So we would, uh, we would uh, use these boxes and, and try and put them underneath a log, put some vegetation matter over it. In the bottom of, the, of this box, which would sit kind of flat, in the back we would put some sort of meat, usually beaver meat. Beaver seems to be a pretty good bait for carnivores for some reason. And we would use um, long distance call lure, which is basically, um, it's, it's basically a, a bottle of skunk essence. It's really nasty stuff. I was, it's, it's, it's awful. So we, when you do a project like this, you often don't smell very good. Um, so the idea being that there would be the long distance call lure outside that would kind of bring animals just generally into the area. You'd have meat in the back of the box. And, and the animal would have to pass under these bars here. And uh, I've got a picture of it you can see. But we have on these bars zip-tied uh, sections of what are basically rodent trap glue strips. So really nasty glue. And what that does is it pulls hair off anything that goes under it. So here is, again, when we started this, we built these really nice wooden box, very well crafted. And, but eventually, for reasons that should have been obvious to us, we, we moved to these more flexible and collapsible ones. One, they're just lighter. So if you have to pack a lot of stuff around, it's nice to have the light one. So here's me holding up. Uh, and you can kind of see there's a bunch of hair. This stuff works really well. Um, to zoom in, you can see in this particular case, I believe this is fox hair, gray fox hair. And it, it pulled out a bunch of it. So here's a map of the areas that we sampled. We kind of started off slow in 2010. We had six sample sites, uh, so three sampling units. And then 2000, and that was in that Savage Creek, Birdsey Creek area. That's just south of Grants Pass, south of I-5. And then the next year, we moved north of Grants Pass into Granite Hill. And then in 2012, we hit the Evans Creek area really hard. And you can kind of see the grid. Um, and here, of course, is Medford. There's Highway 62. So if we zoom in a little bit, here's that Savage Creek, Birdsey Creek area, if you're familiar with it. Here, the, each one of these is a section in the township range section system. These yellow dots are our cameras. So we got two cameras a mile apart and um, a four square mile sample unit. And we did three of them. Similarly, uh, north of Grants Pass in the Granite Hill area. There's another uh, six sample units. And then quite a few in 2012. Now, uh, this is going to uh, show you, th what this map is showing is a little broader image. Because basically, we're, when we were looking in these areas, hoping to catch a fisher, we, we never did catch a fisher in any of these areas. And that's, again, not wholly surprising. We were looking in areas that we hadn't previously documented fisher. So it's not surprising that, um, that we didn't get any on our cameras. But so last year, we wanted to just make sure that we could, um, we would detect them if they were there. So I went down into the Applegate, uh, these red dots down here, and set up some cameras. And I think within a week or maybe two weeks, we had two fisher on camera. Or at least, a, I shouldn't say two fisher. We had fishers at two camera sites. Could have been the same animal. So in the end, we ended up sampling um, 30 grids with a total of 59 cameras. We were short one. We, sometimes you run into land ownership problems where we're trying hard to put these on federal property. Uh, sometimes you know, there's some conflict trying to get things on private. So we had one camera we were short. But uh, I'll kind of, so we didn't. It's always disappointing when you're trying to get pictures of something and you don't get that animal on film. But the, the real point of the study is not necessarily to get something, but just to use a standard protocol 
in an area because as this thing moves forward into a listing process or a delisting process and federal agencies start uh, doing some more management, it's good to know where the species is but also good to know where they are not or where if they are they exist at very low levels. So the protocol we use is pretty good I think at detecting fisher. So if they were there, I don't, think, I don't think they're there in those areas we sampled in any great abundance. There could be some there at low densities or perhaps some passing through as transients. But um, nevertheless, we did get a lot of pictures of some other animals that, are, that were pretty interesting. Let me see if I can step back here. Yeah, so that first picture was a vulture. Here's a rabbit. There's a bobcat <laughs> standing in the same spot. I think a day later or something. See. So uh, you can see the dates here in the times. So the bobcat was there on the 11th. Oh, no, same day, just a few hours later. And right here, this is an example of why it's good to use the flexible, um, non glued together wooden box. Because occasionally bears wake up and they destroy anything that has food in it. Uh, here's a gray fox. Gray fox were one of the more abundant species we had. Uh, interestingly, we know from other data sources, trapping records and observations during other surveys, then the about four years ago, we probably hit an all-time high of gray foxes in our area, Jackson-Josephine County. And, and in that time frame, we then had an outbreak of rabies in Cave Junction and an outbreak of distemper in gray foxes throughout Jackson and Josephine County. Um, and so it was interesting that we saw a lot of gray foxes on our, our cameras. Another gray fox, another gray fox, cougar. And we, we did have, I think, six um, big cougars on our camera sites, which that's always pretty cool when you go to a site and then you look at the video and you see a pretty big cat. A lot of spotted skunks, especially in 2012 when we sampled that Evans Creek area, we had a lot of spotted skunks. Uh, bobcats, had bobcats at quite a few cameras. Uh, flying squirrels, had a number of flying squirrels, real cute. And more cougars. And so that is the reason, not so much with cougars, but again with bears, that is the reason why we put these uh, cameras go in bear-proof boxes, so. Again, spotted skunks. This is kind of an interesting series of uh, videos that shows you a number of things. So first of all, that skunk just went under there, probably would have left us some hair samples. Um, coming out again, more hair samples. So now if you look, here's a gray fox, but that spotted skunk is still in the box. So there's some really interesting interactions between wildlife. So where'd that fox runs off? Oh, here's the skunk. So it becomes pretty clear with these videos who's the dominant uh, creature in this particular exchange. So now, again, that skunk is still in that box. The fox finally <laughs> can't wait any longer. What gets run off again. So we had a variety of different weather conditions at some of our higher elevation traps. We did get some snow. Now, in our area, uh, fishers do not, um, there's kind of a bit of an elevation separation between Pacific Fisher and Pine Martin. Pine martin are uh, an animal like a Pacific fisher in that they're a weasel, but they're uh, lighter weight. They do really well in snow. So in the higher elevation places above 5,000 feet, say, the pine martins are really better adapted in that environment than the fisher. Um, but most of our traps were probably between, oh, 2,500 feet and 3,500 feet. So we did get some snow. Okay, so here's a mouse. And then there's another, uh, you can see the skunk again chases that mouse off. Can't remember what this one is. Oh yeah. 
So this, is, uh, this one is one we're not quite as happy to see, but uh, we're pretty common. So that's a possum. We had possums on a lot of our camera sites. These animals are actually not native to Oregon. These are an invasive species here. And we always knew that we had abundant possum populations in Medford and Grants Pass because we get called every other day about them causing somebody trouble. But um, we've seen that there are actually a lot of possums out in the countryside too, out in the forested areas. And I um, don't know if it's relevant at all, but we actually didn't document that many raccoons. So quite a few possums, few raccoons. Uh, we documented quite a few birds. Uh, usually we couldn't identify them. The video is too grainy and, or black and white. But here's some mountain quail. Rough grouse appear on a couple of them. We saw the vultures earlier. Uh, some robins, varied thrushes. Um, OK, this is our Dr. Seuss slide. This is the fox in the box. And you can see he really wants to give us a good hair sample on this one. So another spotted skunk, again one of our more well-built wooden, wooden boxes. Uh, we had quite a few deer on the cameras as well. Oh, and this is a really interesting one. So again, out in the Applegate, uh, this is a ringtail. If you haven't seen a ringtail before, they're quite uh, charismatic, very big eyes, long tail. Uh, this is a really interesting animal in that, again, this is one of those uh, species that were kind of at the northern end of its range here. So it's, it's pretty neat that we have them and that we were able to catch one on video. Another uh, cougar. It's really fun to work on a project like this because you just never know, you know what you're going to get in the end of the day. Um, it's always a bit of a, a present, a bit of a surprise when you go and open up that camera and pull out the SD card. So finally, uh, like I mentioned last year, we set up a couple different uh, camera sites in the Applegate and we did get two uh, Pacific Fisher on, on our cameras. So this is one of them. And here is the other one. Real, really cool animals. And we had, in this uh, Fisher just tried forever to get every little scrap of meat out of that box. Kept going back and back and back. So in the end, we saw quite a few different species, everything from American robins to western gray squirrels. Um, like I said, we saw two Pacific Fisher. Um, we had a, a, a lot of gray fox, 30 gray foxes, so just basically a gray fox for every sampling unit. Um, and the gray foxes, once they found the box, they would just keep coming back. So um, they would kind of clean you out of bait. Uh, just uh, one raccoon, I guess. I thought we saw a couple, but I guess it was just one. So you compare that to the 10 possums that we saw. So it not only gives you an interesting look at uh, the fisher and the goals of our research to try and find potentially that area of genetic interchange, which it looks like it's not, it's not happening very frequently if it is happening. And again, could be that I-5 is a very um, impermeable barrier to some species. So again, these were kind of our target zones that we were looking at. And so far, we haven't documented any genetic interchange. That's not to say that we put out another camera tomorrow and you know, we pull another hair sample and there it is. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that you know, Oregon Wildlife bought us a bunch of cameras and we think we did a pretty good job getting out and deploying the fisher. But when you buy uh, infrastructure, basically, it's, it doesn't end with that project. So now we have tools that we can use for other things. So my coworker, uh, Rosemary Stucy, is currently involved in a ringtail project. I mentioned uh, that we have a really well-developed and accepted protocol for surveying for fisher. There isn't such a great, uh, well-defined protocol for ringtail. So she's trying to use some research and adapting it to our area to come up with a protocol that we can use to survey for ringtail. Uh, she's, got, she's using the cameras that Oregon Wildlife got us, but she's also bought some radio collars and is putting um, some radio collars on ringtail uh, to help define uh, what their home range is. 
So we've also uh, backpacked in with these cameras into areas into the Sky Lakes wilderness to do some monitoring in that area. And this is a uh, pine martin. So like I was telling you earlier, they're uh, a more adapted species for those higher elevation areas, which that's what the Sky Lakes are. So um, we would pretty, pretty much annually, we'll go on these, oops, we'll go on these, uh, these uh, trips into Sky Lakes wilderness area. We'll pack in uh, different types of bait. We'll pack in some of these cameras and we'll set the cameras up, leave them out there for a couple weeks, and then come back and recover them. And in the meantime, we're also doing amphibian surveys and, and uh, some fish surveys as well. So when we, we have tools like this, we can use them, uh, use them for other work. So uh, that's it for my uh, presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. I also, if anybody wants to look at it later, um, I have a skull of a, of a fisher. So if you just want to check it out, it's kind of interesting. Yes, sir. I have a question. Early, you said that the uh, question as to whether or not to list the fisher as threatened or whatever. And you, you said that uh, it wasn't quickly obvious whether it would be because of other higher priorities. Is there, is there some limit to the number of species that can be listed? Or, or what does that mean? Well, so that's, uh, d so the question is, what does it mean when a candidate species is listed as warranted but precluded? Does that capture? And, and, and what makes it so that it's um, warranted but precluded? What, what constrains the agency from just listing it? Does that capture it? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm in a little bit of a tricky situation because it's another agency. It's the US Fish and Wildlife Service that does that. So I don't really know what their parameters are in regards to that. I do know that they have their hands full with the species that are currently listed. And so I think a lot of it may just boil down to financial time and time commitments, um, and, and hence the lawsuit. So, um, but that was kind of what it was like in the past. Now they're under this multi-district settlement where they are going to make a decision on, on whether it should be or not. And that should be based just on the merits of the, of the of the situation. And the fisher was not the only animal to be in that category. There are hundreds of animals that were candidate species that were warranted but precluded. So, yes? So, I thought it was interesting your list of species and what you captured, Steve. If, if you did the camera sets where you have uh, good numbers of fisher, uh, would you see that same ratio of gray fox in those areas? I think you would. would. Well, okay, so let me step back a little bit. So the question is, if you set the camera traps in areas where we know we have Pacific Fisher in the Applegate, would you still see as many gray fox? Four years ago, I think you probably would have, just because we've, we know from other sources of data that there are gray foxes were everywhere. Now, however, we've had this big outbreak of distemper, and uh, gray foxes, I think their population has probably been reduced due to this outbreak. Um, so now, you know, if we did this survey, kept going with it, we might not see as many gray fox anywhere. But especially in the Applegate Valley, which seemed to be particularly hard hit by that distemper outbreak. We got a lot of calls from there. Yes? So what do you, when you're out in the field, what structure is good uh, fisher habitat? What are the features that so that's a really good question. The question is, when you're out in the field and you're looking at stuff, what defines good fisher habitat? Um, so a couple things, mature forest. So, but it doesn't have to be, you know, 200 year old conifer forest. It can also be a uh, forest with mature oak component. In the Hoopa Reservation, uh, they use a lot of tan oak. So it's not just, you know, it's not just old growth mature conifer forests. It can be mature, uh, deciduous forests of some kind too. But what you need is you need a forest that's old enough to where it d some of those cavities can be developed. So that's important. Uh, riparian areas are, are really good. Um, so if you have some water flowing through there, 
Um, I found just setting up these cameras that if you've got a little water, there's a lot more species that travel through the area. Um, so um, mature forest, maybe some water nearby. Developed understory, you don't necessarily want a forest that just looks park-like. You know, so there's a, there's a few different components you can look at. It's an interesting question, though, because uh, I mentioned previously where uh, the fishers are doing well, um, one of the places being m my home state in Michigan in the Upper Peninsula. That's a place that has been, large chunks of it have been completely harvested, and a lot of it's in second growth. Um, parts of it have been even burned over. So there's a lot of places that, uh, that have had really uh, uh, a lot of intensive forestry use, but now have robust fisher populations. But I think mature forest cavities, a good understory, and riparian areas is probably good. Down logs, snags, things like that. Uh, yes, sir. The pine martin, is that considerably smaller? Uh, so the question is, is the pine martin considerably smaller? And yes, it's, it's quite a bit smaller. And its altitude is, I mean, they don't mix because of altitude? Basically. Well, it's not that they don't mix at all, but definitely the pine martin is more well adapted to the higher elevation stuff. It's so probably around 5,000 feet. That's where probably the fisher starts dropping off and the pine martin starts becoming more dominant. Certainly you can see pine martin lower than that. Occasionally you'll see a fisher higher than that, but that's kind of the zone in there, I think, where you start getting deep snow layers. In our area, is, which one is more rare? the fisher or the pine martin in our southern Oregon area? Well, it probably, you know, the question is which one's more rare in southern Oregon? And it probably depends a little bit on specifically where you are in southern Oregon, but certainly we have pretty robust populations of pine martins in our higher elevation areas. Um, if you go to the north very far, you know, you completely run out of fisher and you still have quite a few pine martins. But in the Applegate, you know, we have a lot of fisher in the Applegate. There, it's a pretty stable population, I think. So it seems like just from um, certainly putting up a couple cameras, getting, getting pretty quickly, putting one up on a random wood, you know, wherever we set up a camera, it seems like occasionally we'll run into them. We get a lot of reports from the public on fisher. I don't know how many pine martin, I don't hear about as many pine martin out in the Applegate, although certainly there are some in the higher elevation areas. Are they predominantly nocturnal? Are, are they predominantly nocturnal? Um, I think they're uh, uh, largely nocturnal, but not wholly, because like on the video there, that fisher visited one of our sets during the daytime. So they certainly can be active during the day as well. Yes? Do you have any examples of vegetation plants that they have been known to eat? Huh, that's a really good question. So the question is, uh, do we have any specific knowledge of plants they've eaten? Um, I don't, personally, but I'm sure that, uh, that we could find that out. Um, it probably wouldn't be too difficult to track that down. I bet it's in the literature somewhere. I just don't know offhand. And sometimes um, things that are recorded, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to look. So um, maybe I can follow up later and find out for you. Yes? Uh, did you mention mountain beaver? I did not mention mountain beaver, but that probably would be another uh, prey source. Yes? Here's just a, a, a theoretical question. If you imagine that the fisher is, actually is listed, do you think there might potentially be modifications in a lot of forest thinning and restoration work done in our forest, since many of them are managed to be park-like? Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't really say. I wouldn't want to get out ahead of it. And, you know, what, what could inform, the good thing is, is that we have people sort of working on that. You know, the Forest Service has this great research project that will probably be able to inform them somewhat on what better management is in the future. So um, I wouldn't want to say, because it's kind of outside of my sure. bailiwick, but, um, but uh, certainly they're going to consider all sorts of different tools to help conserve the species if it's listed. Yes? Why is the Applegate such a hot spot? So the question is, why is the Applegate such a hot spot? And, you know, I, I couldn't say other than to, to kind of guess that 
We have these huge population centers to the north and to the south. So there's been a lot of pressure on things from the south coming north and from the north coming south, meaning the Willamette Valley has been really significantly impacted. It's got huge population centers to the south. We have Southern California, huge population centers, a lot of agriculture, a lot of intensive activities. So it could be that just our area hasn't been quite as intensively impacted as some of those areas. Um, but other than that, I, you know, it's a good question. It's, it's just happens to be where the last uh, remnants are. Yes? Other than habitat loss and some of the things you mentioned, does, does a fisher have natural uh, enemies, things that eat it? Yeah, so the question is, do um, other than th in sort of conservation threats, habitat loss, are there uh, species that prey on the fisher? And, and there are. Um, bobcats uh, have, I think it was in the Hoopa Reservation, their research, bobcats were the lead predator on, um, on fisher. Uh, it's interesting, though, because, there's, of course, there's other things. A lot of fisher um, have uh, antibodies for distemper, so they've been exposed to distemper. Um, there, are, there have been cases of fishers found with uh, anticoagulant uh, rodenticides. Um, in the thought, potentially, no one knows for sure, but we have, in some cases, big marijuana grows out in the forest. They have often been found with lots of these DEET, basically anticoagulant rodenticides. It's potential that that's how some of these fisher have been exposed. Or they might have just gotten into some guy's woodshed and gotten exposed that way. We don't know. But um, so there's other threats from people other than just habitat loss and trapping. Um, but in terms of natural predators, um, certainly other animals will prey on them. I imagine a cougar would. We know that some have been killed by bobcats because we've had radio collared animals killed by bobcats. So, yep, there are predators on, on Fisher. Yep. How do you know the population here is stable? Um, how do I know the population here is stable? And I guess the short answer to that is uh, we don't necessarily know. We don't have a population estimate. But from uh, it's certainly where they occur in the Applegate, you know, the, the, their range in the Applegate seems to be fairly stable. Um, we get a lot of incidental reports of them. They seem to be fairly easy to pick up on the cameras. Um, so I can't say that we know they're stable. We don't know if they're declining or increasing or really what the rate is. But they certainly have persisted in the area for quite a long time. So, um, and then as far as, again, the animals out in the Cascades, similarly, um, we know they're, they, they were reintroduced. We know they're still there. Uh, we don't specifically know the level, but they you know, they seem to be doing okay. Yes? How does one go about dispatching a porcupine? <laughs> well, I wouldn't know how to dispatch a porcupine. <laughs> a fisher? I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I've heard that they spend a lot of time sort of attacking the nose and mm -hmm. orienting, keeping to the front of the animal, but I've, I've never seen video of it. I'm not quite sure how they do it. It's a good trick. Uh, yes? At least by word of mouth is compared to the 70s, there's a lot less porcupines in Jackson and Josephine County. Yep. Any evidence for that? Well, um, so the question is there, but word of mouth is that there's a lot fewer porcupines now than there used to be. And, um, you know, I think that's, and again, this is an animal we don't have population estimates on, but certainly um, anecdotally they do seem to be quite a bit uh, reduced from what they were um, back in the 80s. So. I think I heard you at the very beginning reference that maybe one individual had mixed genetics or possible. Where, where, where was that? So, um, I, so the question is where was the animal with the mixed genetics? And um, I believe it, the BLM captured an animal somewhere in the Howard Prairie, Hyatt Lake, that kind of plateau area that had um, markers from both, so. Any other questions? No? All right, well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time tonight. All right.